Hello and welcome to the video where we will be marking this week's exam, the Synoptic Biology exam. Question 1 is asking you to look at a table which shows the blood sugar levels for two people after eating a meal. We always cat our tables or graphs which stands for, and I want you to write this down in your blue pen, C stands for caption which we've read here, A stands for axes which would be used on a graph but in our table represent the table headings and we look at the trend so after eating a meal person A and person B's blood sugar levels are going up and then down again however it seems to be that the case that person B's blood sugar level always is higher than person A's so that's the trend I'm noticing you're then asked to complete the graph now I've ticked off the points that they've already plotted for me all of person B and the first two points of person A so I know exactly what I'm plotting I'm plotting these three points and you get two marks for plotting the points correctly the way to check your answer is to make sure you've realized that one small box here represents 10 milligrams per 100 centimeters cubed of blood so you're going up in tens on the y-axis if you've got the points correct and your line is a curve that is similar to person B's you get two marks uh, sorry, three marks. Question 1b. How long after the meal is person B's insulin production at its peak? So when will insulin be produced at the highest level? Now, insulin is produced at the highest level when the blood glucose reaches the highest level. So where does blood glucose reach the highest level for person B? Well, it's here, and that is at one hour after the meal. So your answer is one hour after the meal. 1C is asking us what the greatest decrease or the greatest decrease in the blood sugar level of person B in an hour. So you're going to look at every hour and think about where the graph is the steepest going down. So a steep graph, a line, wouldn't be like this, but the one that looks closest to this, going down at the steepest. Where is that for person B? Well, it seems to be the case that the steepest part for person B, when it's going down, is here, between these two points. So if we were to read these two points, I should really use my ruler, or I can just look at the table for hours 1 and 2, and I can do my calculation by subtracting 185 from 230 to get 45. Question 1D, how long after the meal would it take for, persons B, for person B's blood sugar level to return to the level before the meal? In other words, return to 130. So, you must show your working out on the figure. So, what I've done is I've gone to person B and I've extrapolated. So, what it means to extrapolate is to extend the line beyond the data collected. So, to extrapolate means to extend the graph, to draw the graph beyond the data collected. Write that definition down here. Now if I do that and I'm looking for 130, when does it reach the levels before the meal again? It reaches 130 at this time here, four and a half hours after the meal. If you did the same thing and you showed the similar line, anything between four and a half or five would get you the mark for this question, for 1D. Question two, hormones are produced where? Well, they're produced in endocrine glands or by the endocrine system. If you said a named gland, you also get the mark. Thyroid, adrenal gland, pancreas, pituitary gland, and the testes and ovaries are all examples of glands. 2AII. How do hormones move in the body? They move in the bloodstream. And specifically, if you name the component of blood that they travel in, it is the plasma. So the liquid part of the blood is where the hormones travel. Insulin is a hormone. Where is it produced? It's produced in the pancreas. Explain the role of insulin in controlling blood sugar levels. There are four th marks available in this question. The first mark is for saying it lowers blood sugar levels speed up conversion of glucose to glycogen if instead of speeding up you said increasing fine and this happens in the liver and muscle cells 
And the fourth mark is for saying that insulin speeds up or increases the uptake of glucose by body cells. So if you remember, there are two things that insulin does. It helps to speed up or increase the conversion of glucose to glycogen, and that happens in the liver and muscles. And the second thing is it increases uptake of glucose by body cells. Those are your four marks. Make sure you have them written down if you did not get those marks. Right, question three. This is about stem cells. Now it's saying that after a baby is born, stem cells can be collected from the umbilical cord. Now the umbilical cord is the cord which connects the, uh, the developing fetus um, and eventually the baby to the uterus of the mother. And that's how the baby gets its nutrients. These can be frozen, so the stem cells from the umbilical cord can be frozen and stored for use in the future. What are stem cells? So this isn't asking about embryonic stem cells or specifically about adult stem cells or meristem. It's only asking about stem cells in general. So your answer must be general as well. Undifferentiated, undifferentiated cells, or you can use the word unspecialized, that have the ability to, and remember, all stem cells can do two things. They can divide and they can become specialized. If you said any of these two points, you can get two marks. Question 3 AII. Why is it more acceptable to take stem cells from an umbilical cord instead of using stem cells from an embryo produced by IVF? Well, remember, an umbilical cord is very different to an embryo because an embryo is a potential human life, and that's where you get the mark. So you could say it's a potential life, you could say you'd be destroying a human life, or the other way you could phrase it is the cord, the umbilical cord, once the baby is born, it doesn't need it. So it would have been discarded or thrown away anyway, so using it is more acceptable ethically. Whenever you think, see the word ethics, you need to think potential human life when it comes to embryos and stem cells. 3AIII says stem cells taken from a child's umbilical cord could be used to treat a condition later in the child's life. Give one advantage of using the child's own umbilical cord cells. That's the key thing. What's the advantage of using the own umbilical cord cells instead of those donated by another person? Well, first of all, there's a couple of answers. One mark could be it's hard to find suitable donors. The reason that is, could be, in, could be one of your other reasons you got a mark, is it's hard to find a perfect tissue match. Um, and that's because if the tissues don't match, then there's a risk that something will happen. So you must... You could also have said there's no risk of rejection. So you have to say hard to find either a suitable donor or hard to find a perfect tissue match, and there's no risk of rejection. Because your white blood cells would attack the, the donated cells because the donated cells would have different antigens on their surface. I think there's been some sort of infection. 3AIV, why would it not be possible to treat a genetic disorder in a child using his own umbilical cord st stem cells? Well, if you think about a child's own stem cells, they will also have the same gene or the same faulty allele that's causing the genetic disorder. So that's the mark for that question. Now, a common mistake with this question is that people say, sometimes say things like that the cells have the same genetic disorder, but cells don't have a disorder, the person does. So you can't say the cells have a genetic disorder, you can say the cells have a faulty allele or a faulty gene would also be acceptable. But remember, an allele is just a version of a gene. Next question is about osmosis. So there's an experiment. And as I'm reading of potatoes... Perhaps that's the aim. This is one of the control variables. And the independent variable is the percentage sucrose solution. And they're going to be measuring, it seems, the mass of the disc. So why do they blocked them? So remember you got a paper towel with your potato cylinders when we did the experiment and we blotted them dry. Why did we do that? Well, the answer is so that the only change in mass that was recorded 
is because of osmosis and not because of excess liquid on the outside of the potato. If your potato is dripping with water, then that doesn't really count as the water that has been taken in by the potato via osmosis. So make sure you're really clear at explaining this and you state that you only want the change to be because of the osmo because of water moving due to osmosis, not because of any extra liquid on the outside. You're then given the results with the final mass and the initial mass, and you have to calculate the percentage change. So remember, the formula for calculating percentage change is to find the, the difference in mass. So you can do, and by difference, you need to do the final mass, take away the initial mass, and you need to divide it by the initial mass and then you multiply that by 100 to get your percentage okay so you f do final take away initial divided by initial times by 100 it's a bit like the formula you might use in maths for percentage change where you might have um, the 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 new number take away the original and you divide it by the original to multiply by 100 here are the answers make sure you've got them all correct if you did them to one decimal place, fine. If you did them to just two significant figures, fine. But you must have the correct sign. And or you must have the correct word. So if you said loss or you said the negative, you get the mark. Loss or negative, you got the mark. You don't have to have both, but it's always good practice to do so. Um, just so you remember, the loss in mass is a percentage change that is negative. And that will help you with your next question, which involved plotting these numbers onto a graph. Now the numbers you need to plot are the percentages here and the percentage of the solution because that is what you were given. So you're plotting these numbers here. Now remember if it's distilled water the percentage is zero. So on that note have a look at my graph. I've got at zero percentage sugar concentration I had a 30% gain in mass and if we look here for beaker 1 0% and I have a 30% gain in mass the 15% gain in mass came from beaker 2 which is 10% so you need to plot 10% 15 the next you have for 20% sugar solution you have a loss of 10% in mass and then for 30% sugar solution you had a um, beaker 4 you have a 22% change in mass so 22% change in mass there so there's my minus 20 21 22 and then for 40% sucrose concentration we have a change in mass of minus 30% and that's what I've plotted there your three marks are for the first mark is are your axes there with the correct numbers so 10 20 30 40 here going up to positive I was going to say plus there plus 30 or positive 30 all the way down to negative 30 and is it going up regularly and is your scale taking up at least half the axis if your if your 40 stops here because you've cramped it really all up into this part of the graph or you only go up to 30 here and 30 minus 30 here you haven't used at least half of your axis so you would not get that mark the second mark is for plotting the points correctly and the third mark is for drawing this curve now you could it says draw straight lines but I would advise against that it's best to just draw look at the data and you think right well there's no one straight line that's going to go through all of these points so I would try a few different ways and I would realize very quickly that actually there's no one straight line that kind of really goes well so I'm going to go for a curve instead and just draw a smooth curve note my curve is smooth the final marks are available for the following reasons what what concentration is the potato cell sap itself this is the whole point of the experiment so make sure you understand what this is so we tried 0 10 20 30 40 percent now, if the potato had a sucrose concentration of 10% exactly, 
then we would expect there to be no osmosis because whenever the concentration is the same inside and outside then there would be no net movement of water but as we can see that's not the case at 10 percent but our line of best fit tells us that the percentage of sucrose concentration where the change in mass would be zero would be on my graph at 17 on your graph it might be something else so you need to put the number where your line goes through the x-axis where there would be no change in mass and the reason we choose this and the explanation is this point represents no change in mass that's the first mark and the second and the reason that is, I've just put an extra explanation in, because this could have given you the mark instead. This is because the cell sap concentration would be equal to the sucrose solution concentration. Once you've marked your exam, add up the marks out of 30, and make sure that you write your, uh, your number of marks here. What did you get? and make sure that you also complete your other bits of homework.